Welcome, friends. My name is Alicia McBride, and I'm the Director of Quaker Leadership at FCNL. And I'm really glad that you have joined us tonight for our Quaker Changemaker event for July, Quakers and Economic Justice. Before we get started, I want to turn things over to Bobby Trice, my colleague, to share some logistical information. Thanks, Alicia. And hello, friends. I'm Bobby Trice, and I'm running technology for this event. Um, so first, as many of you are already doing, we'd love it if you would say hello in the chat and share your name, your location, and your meeting or church, if any. We are so glad you're here. And as you can see, we are recording this, uh, this of the evening's speaker portions of the event, but the audience will not be included for privacy reasons. Even so, feel free to turn off your video if you're uncomfortable leaving it on. As you may have noticed, captioning is available automatically, uh, but if you do not wanna see the captions, you can click on the live transcript button on your Zoom controls and click hide subtitles. That'll get rid of them if you don't like to see them. Um, we will have some time for you to ask questions towards the end of the event. We'll do our best to address as many questions as we have time for, but we likely will not get to all of them. Please submit your questions in the chat and uh, our moderator will direct them to the panelists. Um, and finally, please contact me if you are in need of any Zoom tech support. You can private message me through the Zoom chat or uh, email me at rtrice at fcnl.org, which I've just dropped into the chat. Thanks so much, friends. Back to you, Alicia. Thanks, Bobby. As we get started, let's just settle for a minute or two of, of grounding. Thank you, friends. Personally, nationally, and globally, the COVID-19 pandemic experience has challenged the rightness of, as, of business as usual in our lives and in our country. It has illustrated the inequalities and injustices in our old system of normal, and it gives us a chance to put the pieces together differently. Right now in the US, we have a once in a generation opportunity to reconfigure our economy and invest in children and families in new ways. I'm grateful to be joined by two speakers who can highlight Quaker advocacy for a just and inclusive economic recovery and discuss the critical role of faith voices in this debate. So our first speaker is Jonathan Jayan Chrisman, who is an artist and urban scholar interested in how culture, politics and place intersect. His book released last year is called Urban Humanities, New Practices for Reimagining the City, and it stakes out new disciplinary terrain for the humanities. And his next book will examine the historic art activism practiced in the Los Angeles neighborhood of Little Tokyo. He is assistant professor of public and applied humanities at the University of Arizona in Tucson, as well as a Quaker and longtime volunteer with and supporter of FCNL. And we are also joined by Amelia Keegan, who is the Legislative Director for Domestic Policy here at FCNL. She leads the team's work in analyzing legislation, advocating on Capitol Hill, and developing legislative strategy. Before coming to FCNL, Amelia worked in a variety of other national nonprofits in DC and Chicago focused on federal budget, tax, and low-income policy. So we have a lot of knowledge and experience uh, with us this evening. I'm really excited to talk about this because I know that we're at this critical moment where Congress could take a huge leap forward to reorient our society in more just, inclusive, and sustainable ways, especially in ways that invest in children and families. And you both have been advocating for this, this more just economy in different ways. Amelia, you're doing this every day on Capitol Hill uh, or virtually these days, um, leading FCNL's lobbying on this issue along with our whole domestic policy team. 
And Jonathan, I know you're lobbying in Arizona, trying to move your members of Congress as a constituent. So I'm looking forward to hearing the perspectives uh, that you bring to this, this conversation. And to get us started, I was wondering if you could share more about what, what does economic justice mean to you? And what does it look like if the US were going to have a more just economy? Maybe we'll start with Jonathan. Sure, uh, thank you. Yeah, it's great to be here. Hello, friends. Um, I'm so excited to kind of enter into conversation with you all this evening. So I love this first question. I'm a humanities scholar, so I like to, uh, you know, get into the nitty gritty and explore what words mean. And if we start with this idea of the economy, you know, I think it's a word that we all colloquially use every day to refer to uh, you know, a super complicated global system of interlocking parts with, um, you know, elements involving currency and trade and taxation and spending and jobs and consumption and production and, and more. Um, it, it comes across, I think, as sort of a big, scary, complicated, abstract thing um, that makes the world go round. And it's something that you know, other people over there figure out and manage. Uh, and because it has this sort of aura, uh, it's been used as kind of a bludgeon in political conversations, you know, in the sense that like, well, you can't do that because it'll break the economy, you know, whatever that is. Um, you know, I think if, if I was to ask everyone here to, you know, close your eyes and visualize the word economy in your mind, you know, it, you might like, you might draw a blank. Um, maybe the first image that would pop into mind is when when things actually break. So moments like uh, you know the Great Recession, where people are getting kicked out of their homes. Um, historically, the term the economy used in kind of everyday language uh, really didn't begin uh, until the Great Depression in the 1920s. So you know it's. Uh, a concept that wasn't in everyday language until relatively recently, even though what makes up the economy, you know, has been around for as long as uh, people interacted with one another and, and created communities and society. So I think it's really useful to just sort of pause and take a step back when we want to think about something like economic justice and, and just simplify what this sort of abstract uh, kind of scary term means. Um, and I think it can be defined very simply. I think it's it's how we as a society allocate resources. That's it. Very simple, very straightforward. Um, and I think it's it's you know it's a moral idea underneath all of that. It's it's who gets what, um, how much do different people deserve, or um, you know what is too much. So I, I think when you kind of simplify it like this, the idea of justice becomes very clear. Uh, you know, if the economy is about allocating resources, then, uh, a, you know, economic justice is about allocating those resources, you know, first of all, fairly, um, and second of all, so that everybody has enough, right? So that um, everyone has enough resources to live a healthy, dignified life. Um, and I think, you know, anyone can kind of look around now and see that there are a lot of people who don't have enough, uh, that we aren't allocating resources in a fair and equitable way, that there are a lot of people who don't have enough resources to put food on the table, uh, to secure housing, to send their kids to the doctor. Um, so, you know, behind all of, you know, the sort of uh, kind of fancy term, I think it's just a very simple, straightforward idea. Um, and, you know, to be honest, I think it makes our current failings that much more upsetting when you kind of put it in very simple terms. Thanks, yeah. Jonathan. Yeah, go ahead, Amelia. Yeah, I would, I mean, Jonathan, I think you said it so well. I, you know, when I think about it, a just economy, it, it really is kind of, it is very human centered, right? It, it is like who's being served and it's what does our society look like? And so I really do go back to, I, th I think the FCNL's We Seeks and our, our policy statement really, really lay it out pretty pretty clearly, but it, it's, it's a society where everyone can live with dignity, right? And truly flourish. And where we see, you know, parents as, as, 
as Jonathan was saying, parents don't have to raise their children in poverty or wonder where their next meal is coming from or how they're going to pay rent, but a society where everyone is really assured a sort of a basic standard of living. And particularly when we're talking about families and, and children, you know, ensuring that every child really has the support that they need to thrive and succeed, um, you know, from their families, but also from the broader community. And that we're really, as, as Jonathan is talking about, where are we investing our resources? Are we investing in kind of those priorities and in, 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 um, in the things that really matter to us as a society? Great. Well, thank you so much for that perspective. I agree. It's sometimes, um, these abstract concepts can get kind of lofty and confusing. And so tying it back to something concrete is really helpful as we as we begin this conversation. Um, but let's move to talking about to, to what the opportunity is right now. So Amelia, what are you focusing on right now when you go into congressional offices? Oh man, yes, as you said, the, the opportunity is huge right now. So um, right now you've probably it in the news, the focus in Congress um, is on this. Uh, and, and so, top priority among congressional leaders and, and the White House is really this this three point five trillion dollar transformative recovery package, and it would sort of move in conjunction or alongside this smaller infrastructure bill. But this is, you know, as we're talking about it, and and, and Alicia mentioned a once in a generation opportunity to really make historic systemic change. Um, we're not just talking about, you know. It, in, you know, putting a little bit more money into a few programs. We're really talking about um, fundamentally reshaping how we invest in children and families. How do we support work? How do we build an economy that is in a society that's just, that's inclusive, that's sustainable? And uh, Congress is considering a lot to include in this $3.5 trillion package, you know, addressing the climate crisis, immigration, um, and we're, uh, we're working on all those things. Um, one thing I particularly want to pull out and mention is the child tax credit is an example of kind of a transformative policy. Now, as many of you may have uh, remem remember the Re American Rescue Plan, which Congress passed back in March, um, expanded the child tax credit in some really important ways, and it could end up uh, cutting child poverty in half this year, right? That is huge. When you think about what Social Security did uh, to dramatically cut poverty among seniors, like that is what we're talking about with these child tax credit expansions. Really, really huge um, in terms of addressing child poverty. And for any of you who are parents, you might have noticed that on uh, July 15th, you might have seen uh, an extra little bit of money in your bank account. Um, because uh, on July 15th, parents started receiving this monthly check of up to uh, $250 for kids uh, age of six and over, and then $300 for kids under the age of six. And you think about that, this sort of monthly check, that is real money. If we take, say, a family with a four-year-old, seven-year-old, a 10-year-old, that's $9,600 over the course of the year. That is real money. And you think about what that could mean for a family. Um, but one of the, the um, threats is that those enhancements expire at the end of the year. So we're on track to make these historic gains in child poverty. And yet if Congress doesn't act, um, it's just gonna spike right up again. So we are calling on Congress to make the child tax credit expansions permanent um, so that you know over a 10 year period, that family that I just kind of talked about well, yeah, that's ninety thousand dollars over the over a ten year period. That's that's significant money. So that is just one of the policies in this in this huge package. But um, the opportunity is just enormous right now to to make some real transformational change. If I could kind of hop on that, um, you know, speaking as someone who's talk to my representatives about this, this specific issue in Arizona, um, you know, it, it feels huge uh, to be doing something like this in Arizona. And I, I imagine, you know, it's like, I guess that's sort of my, my perspective because that's where I'm based. But the reality is I'm, I'm sure this is probably the case across the country. Um, and, you know, you always hear this, this sort of like, uh, Thing like oh my gosh like we're the you know wealthiest nation in the history of humanity and like you know we can't 
do this very simple thing. Um, you know, some of the statistics that uh, that I've learned uh, about this issue for, for Arizona is that right now, one in five kids in Arizona are living in poverty, which is, you know, 20%. That's not acceptable. It's, it's, it's shocking, really. And what that means is there are over 300,000 children in Arizona who might not have enough food to eat, um, whose housing situation is not stable. Um, and, you know, I think the, the other kind of piece of this is it's really easy to kind of talk brass tacks about, you know, dollars and, and the sort of material needs that those dollars will meet, which I think is really important and valid. But I think the other dimension of this um, also is we're talking about, you know, kids and children's and teens um, who are growing into adults. And, you know, poverty has an immense psychological impact as well um, on your life growing up. And those impacts stay with you for your whole life. So, you know, I think when you, when you add up all of these effects, just thinking about, uh, you know, the sort of sum total of, of our human experience and existence, I mean, the, the impact of this uh, cannot be understated. I think that there's, there's, we can get a little bit more into this um, as we continue talking, but, um, you know, I think there's a very clear kind of moral argument here. Uh, you know, we're people of faith and, you know, I think we approach this really from a kind of moral perspective that there are people who, um, because of our uh, sort of unjust system of distributing out uh, resources right now, aren't living up to their kind of creator intended potential. Um, but I think that the, the reality too is, you know, there's also a very straightforward kind of, uh, you know, economic argument that, that this really does pay off over the long term because we're not having to uh, deal with these really dramatic health and psychological and economic and job impacts that uh, kids who grow up in poverty have to deal with for the rest of their lives. Uh, so that's huge. Yeah, and I know when we were talking ahead of time, uh, Jonathan, you were mentioning that, you know, people that you know who might be thinking about having kids, you know, the, the expense of having kids is, is one of the things that is, you know, getting some attention nationally and, um, you know, the ways that, that this kind of support might help people think about, you know, making, being able to make choices that they want to make without having that economic burden um, and, and cost put on them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, you know, I'm in my 30s. Uh, which which makes me a millennial. I know that's like sort of a term of derision, but but it's it's the fact. Um, you know, we're we're all in prime sort of working age, and historically would have would have mostly had you know sort of families at this point. And I think you know there's a lot of uh, a sort of hand wringing over you know why how come people aren't getting married? How come people aren't having kids? You know the the, the birth rate is is so low, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, it, this conversation comes up time and time again with, uh, you know, me and my friends and people that I know is that it's just, it's too expensive. People's uh, economic situation, their jobs are too precarious uh, and they simply don't feel that they're currently in a position to provide uh, for kids that they would bring into this world. Not to mention, you know, the climate catastrophe, which is also a big kind of looming um, issue. Um, but I think, you know, it, again, it's like a lot of this stuff is, seems very sort of, uh, you know, kind of big and, and uh, hard to grasp. But I, I, at the end of the day, it's like a very simple idea. It's that people are, don't feel secure economically. And so they don't feel uh, sort of morally, uh, that it's morally appropriate to bring new life into this world because they won't be able to provide for them. And I think that doing something like the child tax credit will actually have a huge impact on people's ability to plan and raise families like they want. And again, you know, it's like 2020, I think was one of the, the, the first years in, in US history where, uh, you know, the, the birth rate dropped as low as it did. Um, and that also has huge long-term economic impacts as well that are really problematic for sustaining our institutions into the future. So uh, there's all kinds of, of repercussions to this. Yeah, well, I, I think, um, you know, we're starting to see some questions about um, sort of 
some of the nuances of, of the, these proposals. And you know, when FCNL trains people how to lobby, we always have a section that we call preparing for pushback, uh, where we talk about the kinds of things that lawmakers or even anyone you talk to might bring up to sort of um, challenge the proposal that we're putting forward. Um, so when when you're talking about these kinds of uh, this kind of legislation, these kind of changes, what kind of pushback have you heard, and and how do you respond? Maybe Amelia, start on this one. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, I think you know one of them goes straight to sort of what what Jonathan was sort of getting at is one of the biggest things is oh it's it's too much spending, right? This is too much government spending. How will we pay for it? Um, can our country really, re, really afford it? And kind of to what, what Jonathan was just getting at, like, how can we afford not to do this, right? Um, these investments play pay huge dividends in the long run. And, and just as, as Jonathan was mentioning, we, have, we actually have a lot of data that shows that children and families that receive the earned income tax credit, that receive the child tax credit, that receive nutrition assistance, those kids do better in school, they are more likely to graduate, they're more likely to they'll earn more money as adults and have better health comes, outcomes as adults. So there's a, there's a real, um, uh, real, there's, there's a really return on investment in many ways for our society. And that, that's just kind of some of the, the economic justice provisions, let alone like there's, there's parts of this legislation to address the climate crisis as well. And you think about we, well, we have to kind of invest in addressing that as well. So, so many things, but I would, I would also say that, um, you know, while we might see some pushback for the overall package, I think when you look at the individual policies that we're talking about, there is such broad appeal across the country for them, right? It's, it's sort of like basic common sense. Of course, people should be able to take time off of work if they're sick or to, to care for a new baby, right? Having lived, living through a pandemic, of course, we don't want people who are sick going into work, right? Um, of course, every parent should be able to go to work and knowing that they have a safe place that they trust that will care for their child that they can actually afford, right? Jonathan, you were talking about just how expensive it is to, to raise children. Childcare is a huge, huge cost. And, and this bill has, has real investments in that. Universal pre-K, right? Wildly popular. Um, the new enhanced child tax credit that we were just talking about, very popular. And, and even more so, like the way that we pay for it in, in this bill um, is actually in, in some instances, uh, po polling shows has even broader appeal that some, than some of the specific spending priorities. So people know, I think just generally that our tax code, for the most part, it doesn't it doesn't really advance equity, right? Um, we we see the reports we know uh, of like Amazon and Netflix and Apple and other big companies not paying taxes, and so when we say we're going to pay for these things by bringing more fairness and equity to the tax code by raising taxes on wealthier individuals and corporations, like those are really popular things too. So I think. I think overall, it's like, it, this is just another reason of why it's so incumbent upon us to really make our voices heard in this moment um, in calling for these things. Yeah, and I know that we have, uh, FCNL does have an action alert if you're interested in writing to Congress on this. So Bobby's putting that in the, in the chat um, so you can take a look. Um, Jonathan, have you heard you know, people when you've been lobbying or anything have questions or concerns about this this approach. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I, I think Amelia's points are totally right on. I mean, the, the 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 first thing, like I was saying earlier, a lot of times the arguments against are kind of like this vague, act, abstract idea of like, oh, but the economy. <laughs> you know, so I always sort of ask, like, Wait, what do you mean by that? Let's like let's talk about that. Um, you know, I saw some of the questions pop up about, you know, like socialism and capitalism, you know, these big words. And, you know, at the end of the day, what we're talking about is the ability of a family to, to sort of, you know, take care of their kids, you know, and, and when you really look at what the actual policies are, like Amelia was saying, they're super popular across the political spectrum. Um, all kinds of polling is, it's just shocking to me how this sort of popular sentiment about these individual policies seems to totally not align with who is actually getting sent to Congress. So, you know, 
that's another problem <laughs> that we need to figure out. Um, but the other thing, the other thing I'd, I'd say, and um, uh, you know, just more generally, uh, to you know, to encourage people who who maybe are in in my position, which is, uh, you know, I'm I'm not a professional policy wonk or lobbyist or you know, political scientist or elected official or anything like that. I, I'm just, you know, I'm someone who <laughs> kind of cares about what's going on. And, um, you know, I live where I do. And so I kind of make do with where I'm at. And it's been so gratifying to, uh, you know, kind of reach out to other people who um, are, you know, who care about the same things and just go talk to our representatives together. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really easy to go down a kind of black hole of despair when, when, when you read the news and you see everything that's going on and you kind of wonder, uh, you know, is the planet going to exist in 50 years? I don't know. Um, and, and uh, you know, I found that the most um, kind of meaningful thing to do isn't necessarily to sort of, you know, going back, back and forth with the naysayers. Uh, it's really just to sort of uh, organize and, and build community and, and, um, you know, do things like reach out to our elected representatives of Congress. And my experience has been super positive. So I'm, I'm in Arizona. Um, and, uh, you know, so I've, I've had, uh, I was able to set up, uh, a lobby visits with the legislator directors at both Senator Kelly's office and Senator Cinema's office. And I've gone with, um, other folks, you know, FCNL has been super um, supportive and helpful in, in kind of giving me tools and uh, connecting me with other people that I can go with, you know, maybe other folks who are really coming from that kind of faith-based perspective. Um, but at the end of the day, we're, you know, we're all Arizonans and we're constituents and we're, we're going into that office um, uh, with, with that understanding. And, and I think because of that, um, even when I, we don't totally agree on everything, uh, those those staff members are excited to chat with us because they want to know what their constituents think and they want to know uh, uh, you know what's going on in our lives and um, it you know so these lobby visits aren't these sort of like high stakes moments where we're having to like use our skills of of, of debate to convince the staff member it's actually really just saying like you know this is what's going on in our life this is wh where we stand as people of faith this is what we believe um and you know even when we don't always agree i think they've been very receptive to that well can i can i just oh yeah go ahead that quickly like i have to say like one of the things that we've noticed jonathan is in a, a, a you know arizona a state that's getting a lot of attention and i just want to kind of point to the the power of constituent advocacy and what what jonathan's been doing and, and you hear it from us all the time right but um like right now a lot of these offices are just getting bombarded with um meeting requests and so many of those offices uh, don't want to talk to dc staff they only want to talk to constituents and so that's where like folks like you and folks like Jonathan, you can get in and oftentimes talk to staffers that a lot of the DC staffers are might be having trouble getting into to those offices, um, particularly at, at this moment. So I just want to like emphasize again how incredibly, incredibly valuable um, those in-district meetings really are. Well, I just want to pick up on, on something that Jonathan touched on, um, which is the faith perspective that I think um, you know, is is really important, but and that FCNL certainly brings in. Um, as, as Amelia mentioned, you know, offices are hearing from a lot of different people, from a lot of different perspectives, and um, you know, I think what what do you think the faith perspective adds to this conversation, and and why is it so important that that's one of the perspectives that um, that that Congress is hearing? Jonathan, why don't you continue that thought, and then Amelia can can respond. Sure. Yeah, I, I think it's one of the major reasons why I am such a huge supporter of FCNL. It's I really believe in this approach and this perspective um, for a few reasons. I mean, first of all, like I actually believe this stuff. So I think that there's there's a a, a degree of authenticity that sometimes is missing with 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 
uh, you know, kind you know, th these sort of stereotypical ideas of like, oh, like who a lobbyist is and like why they're doing what they're doing and oh, are they just doing it for the paycheck and, and you know, dark money and all that kind of stuff. We actually just really care about these issues because, you know, we believe that people should be treated with dignity. Um, it's a very simple <laughs> kind of moral argument. And I think they're, you know, going back to this question of like, how do you convince people? I mean, maybe you're not going to change somebody else's mind, but I guarantee you that they will respect you for holding fast to convictions that you authentically hold and, and believe. Um, you know, you, you can debate the sort of facts and figures, but at the end of the day, I think a moral argument is 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 pretty hard to to you know poo poo. <laughs> um, the other reason why I think it, it's a really valuable approach, um, and I don't know, I'm, I'd be curious to hear Amelia's thoughts on this and how true this is, because um, th this is just sort of my sort of newbie uh, perspective. But it seems to me that faith based lobbying can build some really uh, kind of interesting, unusual coalitions of people um, that maybe don't agree on other issues, but do agree on on certain things like poverty or maybe the death penalty or or, or taking care of the planet. Um, and I think because you get these sort of unusual coalitions of people who don't usually pair well together from a kind of like stereotypical American politics, like right, left, Republican, Democrat kind of perspective, that you can kind of disrupt expectations and politics as usual when, when you set up these meetings and that people who maybe wouldn't be willing to talk to you otherwise or are willing to kind of open the door and say, okay, well, like, let's at least have a meeting, let's at least talk. Um, and of course, once you kind of get into that conversation, again, I think it's, it's really powerful to approach it from that, that sort of moral perspective. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, Amelia, are you? Is that is that a yeah, valid? No, I completely, I completely agree with that. I think, I think you said that well. I mean, I mean, I, I would touch on a couple of things that you said. Like one is you mentioned the the credibility, right? And I think the credibility of that faith voice in an office is huge. It is why um, we have offices oftentimes reaching out to us to build support for um, their legislation or strategies that they're trying to do because they know just how. Um, just the credibility that the, the, that the faith voice has. And I, you know, the, the moral underpinning that you kind of talked about, that, that is so key. And, and when you have people of faith who say, we will support you representative or Senator so-and-so for taking this action um, because it is the right thing to do. And then showing that you, there's this constituency of, of faith people backing them up. I think that's incredibly powerful. And I think one, one example of that that comes to mind right now is is in the context of this, you know, recovery legislation, the tax side of it is pretty controversial. And you have some members that despite the, the wide popularity and pulling for some of these tax increases, um, they're still a little reluctant. But coming in and being able to say, hey, this is, you know, the the when we talk about the ways in which our tax system has perpetuated this growth in, in inequality and, and these vast concentrations of wealth, that's not just bad for you know, a stable economy, not just bad for society, but we can actually reference instances of scripture that talks about the immorality of that, right? Um, you, can, you can point to Lazarus, you can point to other kind of instances of the Bible that kind of talk about that. And that, that is extremely, extremely powerful. But the, the other thing, Jonathan, that you were pointing to that I, that I completely agree with is like these partnerships right? When we are able to get different, oftentimes we get different faiths in a room um, that are very much disagree on many things and, and some major ways and um, but are able to say, listen, our, our scriptures, our faith teachings on those kind of, on the fundamental moral tenets uh, are absolutely aligned, right? Talking about welcoming the stranger, care for creation, prioritizing the needs of people who are in poverty, there is absolute alignment in that. And we've seen, as you were saying, Jonathan, I'll point to one uh, example of sort of this unique coalition. We work with, you know, the National Association of Evangelicals, African American Clergy Network, the National Council of Churches, you know, you've got Catholic, Protestant groups, evangelicals, you know, uh, Latinx churches, uh, uh, African-American churches all coming together and saying, listen, 
we we disagree on a lot of stuff, but especially on some of these issues, there's this broad agreement on it. Um, yeah, and, and that's been that's been pretty powerful. Well, great. I, I see we have a number of questions coming in, so I want to turn to the the sort of audience portion of this. So please uh, feel free to keep putting questions in the chat and um, and we will get to as many as we can. Um, I want to start, uh, you know, this has been a very wide ranging conversation as I think, you know, anything that starts with the economy uh, winds up being. Um, but I wonder, Amelia, if you could just talk a little bit more about the timing and the and the sort of legislative nitty gritty of, of what's going on, um, you know, how should that inform the advocacy people might be thinking of doing? Yes, yes, absolutely. So this is a this is a critical time right now, um, as you've been probably reading. I, you know, I won't get into all the specifics, of, but essentially they're going to try and on vote before the August recess on sort of a general framework that just sort of puts out overall numbers of different categories that they would be spending on. So that'll be sort of the first vote. And then um, throughout the August recess and then into the fall is when we're really going to see the specifics of the policies um, develop. So it's kind of like the overall, how big, how much are we, we bringing in, what amount is going to sort of what buckets and then they're going to work on drafting um, the actual legislative text sort of throughout August and into the fall. So right now these these coming weeks is a really, really critical time to really be making your your voice heard. Great. Um, so I'm going to move from from that very specific to some of these more uh, abstract questions and we had a couple questions about this sort of um, you know, relationship between the economic justice that we're working for and the, and the capitalist system that we are embedded in. Um, and so, you know, Steve Olszewski and uh, Joe Izzo both were asking about sort of how, how, you know, how possible is it to do economic justice when you're dealing with a system that doesn't necessarily put justice at the center? Um, so maybe Jonathan, do you want to start talking about that and then Amelia feel free to jump in sure uh, it's a I mean it's a great question I feel like it's it, it's a question that I mean certainly a lot of academics are kind of you know uh, uh, grappling with maybe from a more abstract perspective um, because yeah it's I mean it it's it's the it's the water we swim in um, it's the air we breathe um, and there are clearly a lot of things that are that are just not working, and so um, you know the question. You know, it's like, can we can we scoop water out of sinking ship fast enough? Um, is kind of the question. Um, I I often return to this concept. And this is forgive me. I'm you know kind of an uh, again a humanities scholar. So if this is a little too abstract, I apologize. But I I uh, often return to this idea from this. A social theorist named Nancy Fraser, uh, who described something she called non-reformist reforms, <laughs> and so the the idea behind it was that you know there are these huge societal systemic things that um, clearly need to be changed somehow, um, but are but are kind of like almost too big, short of like a, a, a you know a revolution of some kind, uh, a really really. Uh, kind of changing wholesale. Um, and of course, the problem with revolution is that um, usually that comes with all kinds of other really big, uh, 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 unpleasant things like war um, that really harm people in the process. So she describes this thing called, she, she calls non-reformist reforms, um, which are reforms that are within the system, but set us up for changing the system in the future. Um, you know, and I think of some of these things that are that are in this current policy um, as doing that. You know, it's like we're we're still working within the system. We're not we're not you know changing the fundamental nature of society, but we are are setting ourselves up so that people um, you know can can uh, you know have the space and the time um, to build community, to be creative, to think about the future. Uh, which I think are, are fundamental kind of prerequisites for thinking about, okay, how do we change some of these bigger things? 
Um, and, and right now, you know, I think a lot of people just, they can't think about the future because they're too busy just trying to survive today. Um, so that I think is like a, a sort of partial answer. Yeah, I, th I think that was well said, Jonathan. I, I agree. I mean, as you know, you know, we we work with Congress, right? We work, we're working within the system essentially, and so, um, you. Know, but I know, like, where we are as an economy and as a society is, we can be so much better, and we have a lot of models of other, you know, the the child tax credit, like that. The way that that is being implemented is based on like Canada and and what other countries have done, and so we we do have models of we know that. There are some basic things of everyone should have access to quality, affordable health coverage. Everyone should, you know, so these things we can set up um, within the current system, I think, to at least do much, much better than we are doing. Um, and as, as, as Jonathan's saying, you sort of set stuff up for, for bigger change later, too. Yeah, I think um, maybe just to go one step further with this, I mean, I, I don't know if if any of the pushback that, that you've heard on on this from either of you has to do with this idea of socialism and like aren't we just promoting socialism in some way? Um, is that is that a like a stated reason that that Congress that some members of Congress might not support this or sort of how does that work? I don't know. I haven't heard that more than I've about this than I've heard about like other general policies we work on. So I, I wouldn't say that like this in particular is being um, attacked as socialism more than any of the other kind of policies that oftentimes so, are, are sometimes as attacked as social, socialism. And I actually think, you know, within Republicans, there are a lot of pieces of this that have bipartisan support, you know, the child tax credit. As you can imagine, Senator Romney, huge proponent of the child tax credit and has a plan that is very, very similar to what was enacted in the American Families Plan, uh, excuse me, in the American Rescue Plan. The only difference being like he paid for it, uh, his plan pays for it in a different way. But like, he's he says this supports families and, uh, and supports kids. So I think within that, within the paid family leave piece, there are a number of Repub Republicans who have been supportive of that. So, um, uh, so yeah, I think it's the, comp it's more like just the totality of the, the bill that, um, that there's more Republican pushback. And of course, other members oppose different pieces of it. And, and there's pushback from Democrats, you know, it, I don't want to make this into a super partisan thing. Um, so anyways. Um, you know, I think there are a couple of questions that have come in that sort of get to this, um, this idea of power and, and, you know, in some ways that, you know, providing money to a family based on their children is sort of transferring some power to that family to use it in a way that, you know, the government is sort of relinquishing control over, you know, how that money is spent and, and how it incentivizes people. And, um, and at the same time, this idea of like paying for some of this by taxing corporations or people who are, who have more power in our system already is, is sort of, it's trying to shift this balance of power. And so, um, I'm trying to think what the question is here, but like sort of thinking about like, you know, it feels like when we're talking about that kind of shifting of power, it makes people nervous. <laughs> um, and, you know, is that sort of how, how do you approach, you know, that conversation of, of people who are concerned about, you know, sort of handouts or giving people resources, you know, without the strings with it. I mean, this is a, 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 you know, that's a, that's a tricky one. I think, I think what's what the other piece of, that's sort of behind that um, uh, is a question of trust, right? And I think that, you know, there's, there's, on the one hand, uh, there's a lot of uh, evidence that shows that just sort of direct aid, whether it's international aid, whether it's uh, universal basic income, or wh whether it's something like the child tax credit, um, that that money, like the, the vast, 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 vast majority of that money 
um, you know, food assistance, the vast majority of that money gets spent in a way that's actually very efficient and goes to things that are needed. Um, so, you know, but, you know, it's like that evidence has been out there for a long time. And, you know, the, the same people get kind of wring their hands over like, well, what are people going to do with that money? Um, and so I think, you know, I think this bigger question is actually one of trust. Um, th there's also a lot of evidence that shows that, you know, within the U.S., um, you know, we're, we're, we have less trust in sort of fellow Americans than ever before. Um, and, you know, I think that's a really thorny issue to unravel and, you know, ask why that is and um, who's to blame and how do we fix it. Um, but yeah, it, it's a really tricky question. And I, I think, you know, usually when, when um, I enter into conversations like that, I, I try to just sort of dig into this question of, of sort of trust and, you know, why, why it's worth <laughs> losing sleep at night over what somebody else is doing, you know, with, with, their, with their money. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I th it kind of relates to this whole argument around, you know, you hear so oftentimes of the importance of letting state and local governments make decisions about funding because they are closest to, you know, their communities and they know what's best. And I would say the same for family, right? Like a family knows best about what their family's needs are. And, you know, as Jonathan, you were saying, there's tons of studies about where the money goes and people spend it on basic necessities. And I, I do want to point out there was um, this, um, you might have seen it, uh, the stock, I think it was a Stockton uh, study out of California. It's like, uh, you might have might have heard about it. Basically, testing out a universal basic income, which is essentially what we have now with the child tax credit. Right, every parent is getting this monthly check, um, and they found that that those families that were a part of the study actually had higher employment rates and got better jobs because um, that additional money just provided that space to be able to look for that other job or do what they needed to do. So um, I think it's. Yeah, and there's just a ton of evidence out there uh, of like as you were saying, Jonathan, trusting families that they know what their what their family needs are. Um, but Alicia, the point of your your power piece too, I think, is really telling. I think you know when we look at the scrutiny that we place on lower income families versus the scrutiny that um, those with you know much higher incomes uh, get is just. It's, a, it's astounding. I mean, the, one of the pay fors is higher enforcement with the IRS for the tax code because there's this huge gap of people primarily at the top who are not paying the taxes that they owe. So I think, um, so I, yeah, it's just, I, I, I think there are a lot of, a lot of pieces there. That, that's a really great point. I, <laughs> I can't help but sort of chuckle given, given this moment that we're in when, uh, yeah, it's like, <laughs> what what is what is this billionaire spending all this money going uh, to you know to like low or orbit for? Uh, I feel like that's that's kind of a, a more pressing question, but um, you know it it is an important consideration because a lot of people are asking that. Um, so yeah, that's a really great point, Amelia. Well, you you touched on this a little bit, Amelia, but uh, I think the last question from the audience we'll take and then we'll we'll start wrapping things up, but um. Tom Head had a question about the likelihood of a universal basic income. And as you said, you know, this is sort of a universal basic income for another portion of, of the population, but, but how do you um, see, see that, you know, going forward? Yeah, I don't know. I think the hope is that the, at least on, from the perspective of a child tax credit, that that at least is is something, and we'll see where where that goes. But to to expand the the child tax credit, um, but the fact that it is available to every parent, regardless of income, um, you know, there are some exclusions with some immigrant families, but for the most part, you know, that that's a big deal. And um, so trying to, I think the the goal now is to a make that permanent and then build on that. Um, so I, I would just say that that's that's pretty exciting. All right. Well, I'm going to ask one final question, and uh, then we'll we'll start our 
our wrap up, but I, I want to ask, um, you know, that we're in this moment of opportunity and possibility and uh, we don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> and so I think we all need some way of, of maintaining our hope and, and um, energy and doing this advocacy and not sort of burning out uh, as we go. So I wanted to ask what motivates you to keep working for this vision, even when it seems like a long ways away? And what do you want to make sure people listening to this take away? Um, let's start with Amelia and then Jonathan, you can finish us out. Sure. Thanks, Alicia. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, you've said it, right? Like, what gives me hope right now? This moment, this moment. Oh, man, what what an opportunity we have. Um, you know, this, this bill, there, what's on the table is so much of what we've been considering and, and pressing for years. Um, and we, we don't get this sort of chance very often. Um, and so being able to make the, the most of it, yes, you know, it, it's going to be a, it's going to be so much work to like continue to press for this and get all the priorities that we have in the, in the boldness of this package that it needs to be. Absolutely. But um, if you just think about like where, if we get this done, where we could be um, kind of at the end of 2021 compared to where we were at the beginning of the year, um, if we pass that, huge, huge advancements. It's, it's, it would just be incredible. And, you know, we're talking about cutting child poverty in half, instituting paid family and medical leave system in this country, making child care truly affordable, universal pre-K, two free years of community college, expanding health care coverage for millions of people, addressing the affordable housing crisis in this country, instituting a pathway to citizenship for dreamers, TPS recipients, farm workers, essential workers, addressing our climate crisis by instituting a clean energy standard and incentivizing green energy and paying for it all by making our tax code more fair, more equitable. And the, the, you know, the list goes on. Um, you think about like what this means if we get this done, this is huge, this is huge. And all these things are on the table right now. And so the question is like, we just got, we got to do our jobs over the next uh, few weeks and, and months and, and make sure that, you know, when it comes to as Congress is deciding how big do they go and making sure that they actually get it done, that we've got to provide that groundswell of advocacy for, for this just recovery. So um, I think I, I'm just, I am really excited about the moment that we are in and the potential of where we could be um, if, if we all are providing that advocacy and lifting up our voices. So I think, you know, Alicia, you asked final, what, what do I want to leave folks with? I hope that you will all kind of be motivated to, to contact your members of Congress, maybe set up a lobby visit. We really, really need your, your um, advocacy on this right now. Ooh, I, I feel fired up now. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, it's so exciting to be in this moment. Uh, one piece that I'm super, super excited about that I want to give uh, uh, one piece of one little policy that's in this uh, package that I want to give a special shout out um, is that, that clean energy standard. Um, this is, I think, a, a really cleverly designed policy that provides incentives for energy companies to shift their power uh, sources over to clean sources by 2035 and would have a huge, huge, huge impact on uh, the long-term health of the planet. And I think, again, going back to that moral argument, you know, that, that will have such a huge impact on future generations and their ability to have the resources they need to live healthy, dignified lives as their creator intended. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm super, super excited about that. Um, I, I can tell you, you know, uh, the students I teach, the younger generation, I mean, I've had some really sobering conversations. It's dark. I mean, they basically feel as though they have no future. Their future has been robbed from them uh, because of the climate crisis. They, they just don't, you know, they see, they, from their opinion, unless that is solved, it's like, what's the point of anything else? Uh, and, and so to, to actually make a meaningful change and impact in that sphere, I think will be, you know, again, I like all of this stuff is super exciting. Um, but, but again, I, I feel like I've said this like 10 times, but the impact cannot be understated. 
Um, so it's very, very exciting. Um, the other thing that, that I would say, you know, in terms of what gives me hope uh, is, is really just doing the work and building community with other people who are doing the work. You know, again, it's, it's uh, getting informed about this stuff, uh, uh, building community and, and making these lobby visits and organizing. Um, you know, like I said earlier, it's, it's so easy these days to kind of go down uh, a, a sort of social media enabled black hole of terrible news and, and doom and destruction. And, um, you know, it's only made worse when you're, you know, you're kind of in your own head um, or you're, you know, trying to debate some anonymous person on like a, a Facebook, like, you know, message response board or something like that. And, you know, I think our faith um, encourages us to, to build community as well. I mean, that's another part of this. Um, I, I, I pulled up this, you know, scripture from Hebrews that says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And I think um, it's just so true that when you're doing this in community, um, that even when it doesn't feel like things are changing, even when you're not in a super exciting moment like we are now, and that the future doesn't seem super hopeful, um, that you find hope in working together as a community. So I, I just really encourage folks, you know, if they take anything away from this to, uh, uh, yeah, to build community, to reach out to friends and to maybe go do a lobby visit as a, as a citizen lobbyist or, or maybe think about joining one of the FCNL advocacy teams because um, that's a really great space to, to build community and to do some of this work. Well, thank you so much. I, I have enjoyed this conversation greatly and um, saying that you're having fun talking about economic justice is maybe not something that happens every day. So I, I really appreciate uh, this uh, opportunity. I, I know we've had a few more questions come in. We're not gonna have time to get to them, but Amelia, really quickly, if people want more information about what what is under conversation, is there a place to find that? Oh, absolutely. Well, you can always check out our website, uh, fcnl.org, try and put updates uh, on there as well as I uh, hope you're subscribed to our weekly kind of FCNL newsletter this week in the world that has that. But you're also always welcome to reach out to me. Um, my email is just my first name, amelia at fcnl.org, and uh, we'll try and get you answers that way as well. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you so much again. And I will just turn things back to Bobby to close us out with a few announcements. And uh, thank you so much for, for being with us this evening. Yes, thank you, our lovely panel and our audience out there. It's been a fantastic event and fantastic conversation. As you've noticed, I've uh, dropped in the chat a few times our action alert link for uh, you know, taking action on a once in a generation opportunity to fix our economy, but I hope everyone will take a minute to click on that link and send off a message to your members of Congress. Amelia's energy is so contagious. Like I'm about to go and send off uh, an action alert right now to my representative. And I hope y'all will join us in doing that. Um, another quick announcement uh, to continue this conversation and take your advocacy forward on economic justice. I hope you'll consider joining us for our virtual Quaker Public Policy Institute, uh, November 17th to 18th. And I've just put the registration link in the chat. But this November, our FCNL community will gather to advocate for rebuilding the US economy to put children and families at the center, like we've been talking about tonight. We will reflect on the past year of persistent work in the face of the global pandemic, and we'll celebrate Diane Randall's decade of service as FCNL General Secretary and what we have achieved together. So I hope you'll click on that registration link and join us in virtual community as we choose hope and work for justice. Finally, we'll be taking a break from our Changemaker events in August, but we'll be uh, back with our monthly or almost monthly event series starting in September. So keep an eye out for our, an invite to our next event. And with that, thank you so much, friends, and good night.